Hi, everyone. We're going to be starting in a few minutes. Thank you for joining us. We still have some people joining, so let's be patient and we're going to start in just two or three minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. We'll be starting in two minutes. So. Hi everyone, thank you for your patience and welcome to the third webinar in the State of IoT Connectivity webinar series by Monogoto. Uh, my name is Liran Adlin, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at Monogoto. The topic of this webinar is MVNO versus MNO and all you wanted to know about it. Uh, we chose the topic because 
people keep asking about the differences between those two operators and many IoT product owners have a dilemma with which way to go when they choose a connectivity supplier. So we wanted to take this opportunity to clarify and explain to you guys the differences between those two, the evolution and provide a guideline to, on how to select the right connectivity provider. The last 15 minutes will be dedicated to questions. Our host for today is Mr. Maor Prati, is the co-founder and CTO of Monogoto. Maor has 25 years of experience in building cellular networks, clouds, and internet applications. Uh, you can feel free to ask questions uh, in the chat window during the webinar. And don't worry, in case we miss any questions, and there'll be a lot of questions, we will contact you after the webinar. And now, without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Maor. Please enjoy. Thank you for uh, registering to our webinar. It's uh, after two webinars, uh, the third one, I think we can uh, start to call it a series. So now we are happy that uh, we are keeping the, the tradition and adding more content and sharing more uh, with uh, our community. Uh, as Liran said, today topic is, is uh, us talking about MNO. We want to talk a little bit about history cellular are already 30 years old more or less and, and we want to talk about the evolution of how we started uh, where we are today in terms of mnos we want to then move and, and uh, talk a little bit about mvnos uh, how this started and, and the types of mvnos because uh, there is some not confusion but there are like many companies call themselves MVNOs and we want to talk about the differences. And then uh, we want to talk about IoT. We are an IoT company and IoT is very relevant uh, for MVNOs and, and we'll explain why. Uh, later on, we will compare MNO and MVNO in, in relation to IoT use case. So if someone have an IoT use case, uh, what should he choose? And eventually a little bit promotion on Monogoto about our cloud, about our approach to IoT and connectivity. And we will uh, end the presentation today with a little bit of uh, future or how we see the future and, and how we think that eventually IoT is going to evolve from, from MNO or from MVNO uh, to a cloud that is also having a, a private LTE and private 5G. I hope that you would uh, like the content. Uh, feel free to ask questions. We'll try to answer uh, while I'm presenting. And, and if not, we will uh, answer questions uh, there. So, so we'll start with what is an MNO, mobile network operator. The, the incumbent, the, the all the companies that used to be owned by the government and provide landline, um, found themselves in, in the early 90s uh, with a new technology that they can uh, provide. Uh, and this is cellular connectivity, mobile uh, operator. So instead of fixed operator, a new type of operator uh, evolved that is a mobile operator. What makes a company a mobile operator? So first, a company need to buy assets. And, and the assets is, is a spectrum. Without a spectrum, there is no MNO and, and the spectrum belongs to the people. So, so if I'm at the moment living in Israel and, and the spectrum belongs to, to the country, the country is doing an auction for the spectrum. And, and uh, when a company uh, bid for this auction and decide that they, they want to take these assets and, and build a network, that's what makes them a mobile operator. So they're buying the frequency or they're paying for the spectrum and then they can build the operator. They, are, they need to apply to uh, GSMA, to IEEE, they need to apply to the Ministry of Communication to, to have a lot of regulation around it. They need to apply to lawful intercept because if I'm building a network, the police might want access in some condition. The army may, might uh, need some, some access or the secret services. And, and they need to apply to regulation of how um, they can provide good service to, to people. So they need to make sure that the billing is correct and they need to make sure that um, they're giving a good service, they're answering uh, the phone calls of the user and they can fix the problems. But, but predominantly, this is relating to 
company giving service to people and company giving service to people, not only that, in a specific country. And that's, that's the DNA of MNO. The DNA of MNO is a company that to give to my father, that give to my kids a telephone line. And, and uh, with uh, solving all the problems around giving telephone lines to enterprises, to people, to, to companies. And, and this is a specific DNA of, of companies that, that evolved in the last 30 years, I think. And <clears throat> it's amazing in many ways. Uh, MNOs have what we call five nines. MNOs are uh, obligated to cover a whole region and they need to, to do that to keep the license. And, and it's in many ways, this is what build telecom or that build wireless communication, which is what everybody used today. Uh, so that's the incumbent. That's how it all started. Later on, the country uh, countries uh, realized that they can make more money out of, of these frequencies and they auctioned more bands and, and more companies did. And then we got to a situation that in each country today, you have three, four, five, big players that they are MNOs that buy frequencies. They are buying frequencies uh, that can provide long coverage. They are buying other frequencies that can provide high speed, but eventually companies are buying frequencies or buying spectrum and they need to provide coverage. That creates another problem because of uh, people that are environmental, people that are worried about too many radios around around the uh, human beings. And, and a new type of business came of the same tower uh, with uh, multiple radios. And eventually this is a very mature, very mature uh, ecosystem of service provider that sometimes provide coverage by having their own tower. Sometimes they provide coverage by having a shared tower shared tower come in, in multiple ways. So, so companies that want to cover the whole state, it's not, it's not possible for them to do it themselves. So sometimes they will buy radio from, from other, sometimes they will share the radio, uh, the tower with uh, other companies. And eventually, slowly, slowly, they can build a uh, solid coverage. We have few uh, aqua names in, in our uh, cellular jargon that that are often used when, when companies are, are sharing radio. Tower sharing, which means that the same tower, uh, multiple operators can work on it. Radio sharing, radio sharing come with uh, more can and more run, few ways to, to share the radio. And there is also what we call roaming. Maybe uh, AT&T have a solid uh, coverage in, in a certain city, maybe not AT&T, smaller uh, operator, US cellular have solid coverage in a smaller city in the US and he can uh, sell roaming to AT&T. So AT&T don't need to go and provide roaming in, in this region. So this is roaming and, and lately there is a new way of, of providing coverage uh, together with other operator, which is neutral host. It's, it's one radio that more than one operators can, can operate. And, and that's like some, some language around how this ecosystem evolved. This is a very, very mature ecosystem. We have hundreds of, of operators uh, around the world that provide coverage. And, and this is the basis, I think, of, of literally any communication between two endpoints that is wirelessly in the world. So what is an MVNO and, and how, how it all started? So MVNO stand, stand for virtual network operator, mobile virtual network operator. Mobile virtual network operator, the, the, the basic meaning says that it's a company that didn't acquire spectrum and acquired license or, or is using somebody else's license to provide cellular connectivity. And a company that didn't buy spectrum is a virtual operator. And, and uh, usually virtual operators need to distinguish themselves in, in various ways. So they will need to apply to regulation. They need to, to sell to people. Maybe other MVNOs will sell to, to enterprise. We will talk about it later, but they, they don't really own the spectrum, but they need some 
some edge on the market. And, and in the history, the edge that uh, MVNO uh, brought was edge that is more marketing or, or maybe a little bit ethnic. So we see MVNOs that go for young people. We see MVNOs that go for foreign employees. We see MVNOs that bundle cellular connectivity, maybe with television or maybe with uh, internet. So the launching an MVNO was more about marketing or, or product and less about technology innovation. And, and this is to usually to be able to have a lean company that will have a, a lower margins than, than the big operator, also a lean operation and, and can do good marketing. Exactly like um, in supermarkets, you have uh, the, the main brand and then you have like some other brands that eventually are, are being made in the same factory or any other OEM. So that's how MVNO started. And I think the, the first MVNO version, and today we have hundreds of MVNOs and, and we have different kinds of MVNOs uh, that are uh, out there. So the types of uh, MVNOs are, uh, are, are uh, light, medium, and full. The light MVNO, sometimes you don't really call him an MVNO, you call him reseller. Most operators have some sort of a reseller platform that is, is white label. So maybe I can have a SIM card that is with different colors. Maybe in the billing, it will be different logo. Maybe on the pricing, it will be bundled with other services or different way to bundle it. Maybe the bundle can be with some value added services that are less related to the main business of the operator. So many operators have some sort of white labeling and, and thanks to that white labeling, another company, and sometimes it's in some countries, it's even the operator himself, can open multiple brands and, and can have few brands, but eventually using the same backbone and the same technology. So a light MVNO don't have the radio, of course, don't have the core network, don't have even any value added service and, and not even a billing system or back office. They only offer a, a new pricing, maybe new branding and, and different distribution. And, and that's a light MVNO. Then later on, another uh, type of MVNO uh, arose, which is medium. Medium MVNO is an MVNO, again, without a network, without the core, uh, without the frequencies, maybe some value added services, like an MVNO for foreign workers might have a foreign phone number. So if I have an MVNO for Thai people in the, in the US, the, the person from Thailand can, can get a Thai, Thailand phone number. So value added services can be little features that, that make a difference for specific community. And, and for the MVNO, this is usually a unique selling point and, and a great business. Back office to manage the user. And then, of course, any MVNO needs to, to be able to offer different pricing and different packages and, and different go-to-market in, in the distribution. So what is a full MVNO? A full MVNO is a company that decides to buy all the technology that is needed to run a mobile network, but is not acquiring the frequencies. So a company that don't acquire the spectrum, don't acquire the frequency, but they have their own core network, meaning when they have SIM cards, the SIM card registered in their network. They are not just reselling the SIM card, they are not just buying profit. They have, of course, any value added services that they want because they are the owner of the network. They are the owner of the billing, they are the on, all, owner of the whole, uh, the whole technology stack. And, and a full MVNO is, is the most flexible MVNO and it's also the MVNO that have the most independent out of the, the others. Uh, unfortunately, maybe, maybe unfortunately, I don't know if unfortunately is the right word here, but I think more than 80% of the MVNOs that are out there are not full MVNOs. More, more than 80% of the MVNOs in the world are either reselling from, from another platform, the, the name is 
is a, a using an MVNE. They're using an enabler for MVNO, so they're not really with the control on the technology. Or medium, which means that they have some sort of capabilities, but not full capability. The, the reason that the percentage of full MVNO is low is because it's, it's much harder to operate and you need more commitment from, from the company uh, to do that. And then, then there was IoT. And, and when IoT started, it, it's kind of changed the whole game because if until IoT, or let's call IoT in the old acronym, M2M, machine to machine, if until then we were only dealing with people and, and to deal with people, it's, it's a certain DNA and certain capabilities. Now, in, in nowadays, and, and I think also in the future, we are not going to deal with people anymore. Or maybe we will de deal with people, but uh, the people will be a small fraction of who we really need to deal with. And, and IoT is a tractor that, that will not, never call the, the service center if the phone number will not work, it will just not work. Or, or some other tool that need different type of connectivity. But IoT started, but there are no MNOs that are capable for IoT and tailored for IoT. And there are not also MVNOs that are tailored for IoT. But there, there was a gap in the market. And to this gap in the market, there was uh, sometimes capabilities that were covered by third parties and sometimes capabilities that were missing. But I think in the in the beginning of, of M2M and in the beginning of IoT, like if, if somebody is building a product, he's, he's using a, a human being SIM card to provide connectivity for smart lights, for, for a automotive or for a tracker. And, and that's not the, the best practice and not the best way. Why? It's not the best way because the IoT needs are completely different than, than human beings needs. The IoT needs also the type of companies that are doing IoT are, is, is different. So, so first, first thing is a company that build an IoT device most probably have global inspiration. So it's, it's a little bit different than a company that decide that they want to have a, a MVNO for people that are under 20 and, and below uh, uh, above 20 and below 30. It's, it's different than a niche market. It's usually companies that want to go global. And, and when you want to go global, you need to consider uh, who can give global coverage. Then there is another problem. An IoT company often have different type of requirements. Maybe they don't want a physical SIM card. Maybe they want the, the SIM card on a specific form factor. Maybe the SIM cards need to be easy. So now, you need a whole new set of capabilities from, from the operator that he's not really used to because the operator used to do certain type of, uh, of uh, sell certain type of SIM card. The IoT companies have big problem of, of pricing. If in, in, in cellular days, the, the acronym for revenue is ARPU, average revenue per user, we don't have users in IoT, and not only we don't have users, the, the users that are things are, are using very minimal data. Like uh, my kids, when they watch YouTube, use more data than uh, street lights that is, is uh, communicating with the server a few times a night. And IoT is not using really too much data. Operators traditionally are, are, are only thinking in, in packages. And, and there is a big gap in how I can optimize the pricing to the product. There is a big gap in how I can deliver a good business, uh, how I can support business to grow when, when my best practices are, are not there and, and my, when my KPIs are towards uh, packages. Then IoT developers also want uh, some tools to make their life easier. We have customers that are, are very old uh, IoT companies that solved many problems that they shouldn't have solved, but, but other operators couldn't solve it for them. So developers or IoT companies need someone to make their life easier and, and that's another need. So going on with, with the list of needs, self-service, 
IoT companies, and, and I think people in general don't want to call somebody and wait on the line to, for, for something to happen. And in, uh, maybe in, in people it's okay because I, it's, it's not too much that I ask from the network. But on IoT, maybe I want fixed IP address, maybe I want to block something, maybe I want to check a SIM card, and I need to be able to do it myself, and, and maybe I even need to do it automatically. And, and these type of capabilities are, are very important for IoT use cases. And uh, how we can increase security, how I can block some, some network protocols, how can I get events in, in real time from the network. So we, we see many, many features that IoT companies need in order for them to, to have a solid use case. And, and eventually, What's, what's the option? The option is either to use a cellular provider or to build a, like a Wi-Fi or, or lower network, which is even, even harder. And, and this is why IoT MVNO started. And, and IoT MVNOs are, are started to give, uh, to give solution for, for the connectivity needs of, of these uh, new devices. It's, it's now not connecting people anymore. It's connecting devices. And, and we need to be able to support those devices in, in a way that it's, it's more automatic and more uh, scalable. So when, when someone have an IoT use case, he can either go to an MNO or he can go to an IoT MVNO. IoT MVNO in, in some ways will have the advantage uh, and, and MNO, might have also advantage in, in some ways, but, but uh, this is the way we see the, the, the market. First, global connectivity. So MNO and MVNO can offer global connectivity. My MNO have roaming agreements with more than 100 operators and, and global connectivity, it's easier for everyone to offer. So to offer global connectivity, Maybe both, both MNOs can. An IoT MVNO might have an advantage because an IoT MVNO might have multiple MNOs that they are working with if it's a full MVNO. And then they can have redundancy on, on the MNO side. So uh, we, we can demonstrate a, an MVNO that has agreement with uh, two operators, and then if one operator have a problem with pricing, with coverage, with any, any uh, technical or commercial aspect, you can, you can go back to the other operator. So that's give another advantage for the MVNO on the global connectivity. But, but it's fair to say that global connectivity is checked both on an MNO and an MVNO. And then, like I said, the roaming agreement, either I have only one identity to work with, or I have multiple identities, and then it's easier to, to have a more uh, resilient network. MNOs are also a little bit uh, behind in the ability to provide multiple identities on the same SIM card. Uh, companies like Monogoto, companies that are IoT MVNOs, are able to give multiple identities on the same SIM card, and then this gives a big advantage for a customer to, to be able to get a promise that the network will stay alive always. It's, it's fair to say that MNO is, is powerful enough to, to make the same promise without having multiple identities. But so, so we can say that it's maybe even in similar. One is doing it because it's a big company and the other is doing it because they have multiple profiles and they can give a redundancy on, on the last mile. An MNO usually will only support one network in a country and an MVNO will be able to have multiple network in the same countries. And, and this is a, another benefit for the MVNO. Then we're talking about self-service. Most MVNOs will have solid self-service and, and self-service is great for IoT use cases because they are not talking about one SIM card that you just need to activate once. You need to check 
many times the, what's going on, you need to be able to monitor your network, you need to be able to activate SIM cards, deactivate SIM cards, see billing, uh, uh, create tasks, and, and this is very important, and self-service uh, is uh, critical for, for any new use case, and, and especially, especially on uh, connectivity management. Developer API is also important. Not all MVNOs have it. I think that may, maybe it's it's too much to say that MNOs don't have any APIs. Uh, so I'm sorry if people are offended that we say that MNOs don't have any uh, API. MNO might have little APIs, but they are not really maintaining them and they're not really using cloud best practices to, to make it something big. So I, I'm sorry if people, if, if if uh, if uh, we we were too hard with MNOs on the API side, eSIM, eSIM is also important. eSIM is a little bit against MNOs because uh, ultimately eSIM allow the flexibility to the customer to switch on IoT and, and on consumer. And, and MNO in the beginning didn't really like it. Now MNO are starting to get on board and, and understand that they need to offer eSIM. For, for MVNOs, eSIM is, is obvious. Nobody really wants to, nobody really wants to um, force a, a customer for, for lifetime with a SIM card, especially on IoT, especially when it's hard to, to change a, a SIM card. So eSIM is, is critical for IoT and it's critical that, that any IoT platform will have it. And then eventually um, optimize business model or, or what we maybe want like to call it sometimes the consumption based pricing, pay once and forget, all kinds of business models that make sense uh, for IoT and make less sense uh, in the traditional operators are also very, very important. So, so this was this was like a little bit about IoT, a little bit about what offering uh, we want to to get if we have a, an IoT use case, and and now we'll talk a little bit about Monogoto and a little bit about how we are uh, approaching this uh, market and and a little and and maybe also about the future. So, we are a cloud-based MVNO. We are a full MVNO, and, and based on, on the fact that we are a full MVNO, we have few best practices, some that we borrowed from the cloud and some that we, we are working uh, with traditional operator. So we are integrated to multiple operator, allowing us to have a multi-identity, and, and this multi-identity allow us to, to have more resilient for our users uh, with SIM card, meaning, if we have a, a scooter and the scooter wants to connect to a, a UK a tower, it can connect to AT&T, uh, sorry, it can connect to everything everywhere. It can connect to Vodafone, it can connect to Telefonica. It can support multiple network on the same SIM card because we have two, two backups. One, we have multiple roaming agreement. The second, we have multiple different identities. So this is the flexibility on top of other flexibility. And from the other side, we are using cloud best practice. And, and for us, when we're talking about cloud best practice, we're talking about three important things. One is self-service. I want to be able to do everything myself. Even if, if somebody is opening a ticket, he needs to open a ticket with support, but the support should use the same tools that the, the company use and, and maybe just help them uh, to activate the platform. API for automation. Sometimes self-service is great, but API allow an IoT use cases to be more secure and more automated and then with uh, the proper auto scaling. And the last best practice that uh, is, is uh, important for literally any cloud company, and, and we don't really see operators working in this way, is APIs and integrations to other services. It can be an automatic VPN creation to, to AWS. It can be an automatic alert to pager duty if my SIM cards are, are, are working less than before. 
it can be an automatic event uh, to Slack to, to tell me that a new uh, IoT device uh, was just uh, uh, registered. So the ability to connect a cloud to other cloud is, is very critical and this is part of, of who we are. So, so if we look at our roaming agreement and the connection to the cloud and the APIs and self-service, this is a full MVNO and that have multiple resilience. Now with, with the change in regulation and, and with uh, some movement in the market, especially around uh, private LTE and private 5G, we started to realize that in some use cases, we are also the MNO. If a factory needs a private network, and if this factory uh, needs the private network for, for automation, he can get a frequency from, from the government. And in many countries uh, now, there are uh, selling frequencies uh, according to GPS coordinates. So if you are in a specific town or in a specific place, you can get frequency for this place. And now suddenly the factory is the owner of the frequency. And instead of using the operator, you can use the factory network to connect to Monogoto Cloud. So this is where the borders between MVNO and MNO are starting to get more blurry. Suddenly companies that have full MVNO cloud core with regulation in countries that support private network can play as an operator. So traditionally MVNO was only virtual, but, but going forward, we see more and more companies that are able to connect private radio in 5G or 4G, and now there are a little bit of operator in, in some places. And, and uh, to kind of summarize the, the differences and where the future is going, uh, we have a small illustration of a possible future. And uh, that uh, we think is not so far ahead of us. And this possible future uh, can, can happen in multiple industries, but let's assume this is a, a, car, a car company. And this car company has multiple needs. Traditionally, the car company used to go to an MNO because they're huge and, and they used to buy SIM codes from an MNO. And, and a car company that's buying SIM cards from an MNO uh, probably pay per gigabyte and, and get uh, coverage that is nationwide. So this is the traditional use case. Uh, MNO that have public access, maybe they buy it from, from us, maybe from somebody else. But where it gets interesting, it gets interesting with 5G, with slicing and, and with private network. With 5G slicing and private network, the company can have their own radio in the factory. So now in the factory, they are the MNO. They are the network operator just for themselves. They can also license the service center to have their own radio also. So now the service center also have some sort of a radio in the service center. And now let's think about the use case that I will, uh, that the car company will have connectivity in the factory. When the car leaves the factory, the car connects to the public network to get connectivity from the public network. And this connectivity may be, maybe it's expensive, maybe on every gigabyte that the car is doing, the car company is paying $10. But it's not important, or maybe it's important, but not always because when the car is getting into the service center, now the car company can get a slice from the service center and the data will go directly to the car company with low latency or lower latency with a different slice. And, and of course, with completely different pricing per gigabytes because this is staying on, on my network. So a possible future is that public network will merge with public network that companies will be able to offer a hybrid solution. We, we call it now super slice. This is a little bit of, of a, case for, for one of our future uh, presentations that is going to talk more about private network, but a possible future is a, a future where the public and private will be more blurred and, and an MVNO and MNO will, will also will be a little bit more blurred. And this is all thanks to 
new technologies that are coming, 5G especially, and, and a regulation that is very supportive from, from government. So we started talking about incumbent and MNOs and, and just a single network in a country. And, and we are getting to a situation that there are more and more networks uh, around us. And to summarize uh, my sales pitch, we are selling IoT connectivity as an MVNO. We are selling private network as an MNO. And on top of that, we have a lot of integration and value added services and APIs and capabilities that, that are all tailored for IoT use cases that are all tailored for with cloud-based practices for any need that, uh, that is going to, to come in the future. Uh, we had a lecture a long, not a long time ago, like a year ago, that nobody was really Nobody knew what will be the killer application in 4G, and eventually Ubers and, and uh, Airbnb and, and applications like that become the killer application. So we don't really know what will be the killer application of 5G. Some people think it's it's a virtual reality, augmented reality, and all kind of capabilities that need low latency. But we don't really know. But we do know that that you need innovation to do those things. We do know that when you will make it easier for companies to deploy these networks when you will make it very flexible, like to work on any radio, to work with any CPE, to work with any band. Sometimes it may be a band for high speed. Sometimes it might be a band for long range. We, want, we know that these capabilities can drive innovation. And, and this is why we are building our cloud. This is why we are pushing uh, to developers so we can be an enabler for, for new ideas and for new use cases on our network. That was uh, uh, our uh, pitch, or maybe our uh, view of MNO, MVNOs, and, and what's happening. We'll be very happy now to, to answer questions. Uh, who is moderating the question? Sorry. Hi. Yeah. So we have some questions, guys. If you have any questions, please uh, leave them in the chat below. We already received some questions. So the first question: If if an MVNO uses Profile X by MNO, wouldn't it be better to get Profile X directly? Question to Mo. Uh, it it depends. If somebody is getting a profile from an, an MNO. Uh, is, is on the MNO network. When he's on the MNO network, he have less capabilities rather than on a network like Monogoto. Less capabilities meaning he can have less visibility, he can have less uh, control over the connectivity. And, uh, and maybe the, the, other, the other thing is that also it's not going to be easy to change the profile in the future unless it's an eSIM. Okay. Uh, is there a different uh, SLA approaches between MNO versus MVNO connectivity? Uh, in some cases uh, on IoT, the SLA required the um, specific coverage. And, and in specific coverage, sometimes the MNO can position an advantage because the MNO can decide to add coverage in this area. But sometimes if, if the MVNO have multiple roaming agreements and and you can access more than one network in a country it can cover the coverage problem by offering another network so so now there is a question is it enough to have just at t in the us with the power of at t adding sites so this is good enough to have t-mobile and at t assuming both of them have more coverage Okay, the next question is, if you want to change, if I want to change my connectivity vendor, what is the approach between MNO versus MVNO? To change connectivity, uh, either you have an eSIM and, and with an eSIM you can push a new profile and then there is a question which eSIM platform you have because you might have an eSIM with only one MNO on this eSIM and then you can't, you can't really change the, the profile. Uh, with an MVNO, you are usually more flexible. You're more flexible because 
sometimes you can negotiate with the MVNO to add more connectivity. And, and many times also the MNO, the MVNO can allow you to, to switch to another provider. Okay, thanks. The next question is, um, I know that other MNOs offer IoT. What is the benefit of IoT MVNO? So the, the, the benefit of, of IoT MVNO uh, eventually is by, by serving IoT and, and understanding the IoT issues. And, and just a, a give an example, a uh, few, like I think a year and a half ago, there was an IoT point of sale that, that we gave service to and the IoT point of sale was not working all the time. Maybe it was a shop that not too many people uh, uh, bought there. And, and because it's not getting connected all the time, the connection uh, uh, went to sleep and, and stopped working. And IoT and VNO can solve this problem by, by pinging the device. IoT and VNO can solve problems like that by, by understanding the device need and, and adopting to that. Okay. Uh, the follow-up question is, what kind of tools does IoT MVNO offer in comparison to tools offered by MNO? So APIs are very important. MNOs are, are not really offering APIs. MNO maybe do device certification. MNOs maybe are doing a um, like if, if a big car company will come to an MNO and, and they want to put 200,000 cars or 10,000 cars in, in, in a place, MNO will take it as a project and, and serve this company. But uh, in our opinion, the tools need to be self-service and the tools need to be externalized to the, the company so they can use them. Okay. We have another question. Do you have multi imz features on your SIMs with fallback? In case MNO core or your own core has an outage, my company only work in critical communication and resilience is important. So multi imz is, is a big name and it's great to have. And, and of course we have it. Uh, when you have a multi imz you can register on the platform. So the, the multi imz is a backup for the network, but multi imz is not really a backup for, for the core. So if a company have a multi imz and the whole core goes down, although company don't supposed to have one core, they need to have multiple cores. So a company like Monogoto have multiple sites. If one site goes down, another site will take the traffic. But ultimately a multi imz solution allowing you to recover from the MNO going down. And if you want to recover by your site going down, you should have two sites. We have a question about the cost. Are the SMSs are with free cost? Almost in all the countries on, in the world, incoming SMS is free and outgoing SMS cost money. Okay, another question. How will you deal with future regulations with potential roaming issues? Uh, where you will need to localize with a particular MNO in different countries? Uh, this is a good one. Uh, in many countries, sometimes uh, there are uh, restrictions for roaming. No, sorry, I will rephrase it. In some countries, sometimes there is restriction for IoT roaming. For example, in Brazil, it's almost impossible to get IoT roaming. In some countries, some networks are charging uh, a fixed fee to allow IoT roaming. And, and thanks to the fact that operators are many, and, and usually it's relationship between operators that uh, dictate what's allowed and what's not allowed and, and not regulation, although like in Brazil it's regulation. So I think uh, I, I'm happy to say that in more than 80% of the countries, it's not issue, maybe 20, 10, maybe even less than 10% of the countries, uh, this is an issue. Okay, another question, which I actually really like, what does the company name Monogoto mean? This uh, you can answer, Lila. <laughs> Monogoto means things in Japanese. Yeah, we believe in things, we believe in the internet of things and, and uh, this is uh, the meaning of Monogoto. 
Okay, another one is who provides the radio nods in a private car factory and in a service center? Does Monogoto or the property proprietary? So we want to stay agnostic to the radio. Uh, we can recommend the, the radio. We can uh, help uh, source the radio. We work with uh, multiple different radios. Uh, so going forward, this will be bring your own radio. Uh, at the moment, uh, Monogoto helps uh, providing the radio. Okay, the next question is, let me see, the next question is, if we're going with an MNO, what are the most important questions to ask or things to check in future proof already? It's it's depending the use case. If it's a global use case, uh, um, not all MNOs are tailored to sell globally. Uh, if it's a, a use case that is, is using uh, minimal data, also need to understand very well the the business economic around the price per month, uh, price per SIM card per month, uh, you don't want it uh, to be high. And, and uh, eventually it's very important to know that, that you can get good service. Usually MNO's uh, service is not tailored for IoT and that's a big problem. Okay, so we only have time for one last question. Uh, the, next, the next question is, I want to make sure I'm not being locked in vendor, hardware, manufacturer, etc. What should I do to maintain maximum flexibility? So to avoid locking, uh, you need to choose a, a vendor that allow you to leave. Uh, this is by providing the, the keys for the SIM card, or this is by providing an eSIM, or this is by providing a um, a way for you not to be obligated to, to the same operator. So eSIM can be a good solution for that or operator that is flexible enough to allow you uh, to change the identity of the SIM. Okay. Uh, these are all the questions. I mean, you guys are sending us questions. If you want us to answer your questions, please send it to our email or website. You can contact us. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions and unfortunately there's no time to answer all of your questions. So I want to thank you everyone for participating in this session about MVNO versus MNO as a part of the state of IoT connectivity webinar series. And thank you Ma'ol for this interesting session. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and that you find it informative. Um, thank you again and we hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.